So um, let's start our um, client webinar tonight. Um, start by welcoming everyone who's joined us, all the horse owners, the uh, clients of the various CVS practices. Um, thank you for joining us um, for this webinar. Um, it's going to be a webinar on wound management. Um, and it's a bit of a historical moment for the Al Northumbria Veterinary Group because it's our very first um, online client evening. They're usually um, in person and it's quite a different kind of atmosphere, but it's, uh, it certainly has been the way forward during um, COVID lockdown times. And um, as you'll know, Patrick's very, very experienced in Zoom meetings. So he's going to be leading the show, which I'll introduce in a second. Um, and before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you probably know that we are running a quiz and the quiz is going to be based on um, general facts about wounds and wound healing. Um, there's going to be 10 or 11 questions um, and that's going to go on to the Al Northumbria Veterinary Group Facebook page straight after this webinar and it's going to be open for approximately an hour and we, you fill in an email, you'll see how you do it. And we will then um, um, allocate the winning prize, which is a first aid kit from the Alan Thumbry Veterinary Group and a bottle of fizz. Um, and um, we will let you know if you are the lucky winner and we'll announce on Facebook who it was. Um, so don't forget to go to the Alan Thumbry Vet Facebook page for the quiz straight after this webinar. So let's, to, to get started, the topic, as you know, is wound management. And um, unfortunately, it is a common problem that as horse owners, we will often face. And it's knowing um, what to do with small wounds, large wounds, when to call the vet. And also um, you know, to what is the best way of managing a wound going forward. And for that, um, our main speaker tonight is from um, the Edinburgh Veterinary School, the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies. And Patrick Pollock heads up the surgical team and the equine hospital at the Dick Vet. He's a specialist in soft tissue surgery. Patrick has for many years been a very big support to the Al Northumbria Equine Division, um, not only for surgical procedures, but also um, all hours of the night talking about cases, looking at x-rays and is extremely helpful and a valuable uh, part of our team. So I'd like to introduce Patrick soon and supporting Patrick we have three of our vets from Al Northumbria we have Alice Barker um, we have Norea Carrazzo and Amy Smith Alice graduated in 2018 from Liverpool was an uh, intern in New Zealand and then joined the Al Northumbria Veterinary Group Norea um, qualified in 2017 from Saragossa in Spain did I say that right um, Norea um, and she then uh, did an internship in Ireland, uh, worked in Lincolnshire in practice, in equine practice, and then joined the Al Northumbria Veterinary Group. Amy Smith, 2017, from the Royal Veterinary College in London. She was a graduate. She worked in the borders for a short time, then became an intern um, at the Edinburgh Vet School. And so knew Patrick at that time as well. And then she, we were lucky for her to join our practice as well. So three great young vets who will be presenting some case scenarios after Patrick has um, run us through a, um, some facts about wound management. So Patrick, if you're ready. Thank you very much for the introduction uh, and the opportunity to, to speak. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to, to speak with all these, um, these great people this evening. So thank you very much um, and thanks everybody for, for coming along. Um, I'm going to start with a warning, uh, I guess, and that is that um, we are, all of us here speaking tonight, trauma enthusiasts. So we like horses with holes in them. And that may sound quite odd if you're the owner of a horse, um, but we like holes that we can close, essentially. So we make no excuse for showing you some, some really quite funky pictures this evening uh, of horses with various bits and pieces missing from them, um, and hopefully showing you some really good outcomes uh, that you can achieve 
if you treat wounds in a, an appropriate manner. So um, with that warning, I'm going to uh, plow straight into showing you some, some pictures of wounds and talk a little bit about wound healing. Um, obviously, Leslie's um, outlined the, the plan for um, how we'll deal with questions and things. There's a question box that you can scribble your questions into if you have questions as we go along. And, and Leslie will, will answer some of those as, as we go. And then we may take have time for some of them uh, as we go through the presentation and at the end. So please feel free to ask anything that you that you maybe uh, are curious about. So um, the first thing to say is that humans are really interested in wounds and we have been for all of the time that our species has been on the planet. And we know that because we have got all sorts of fossils and um, bits of uh, early humans, which have got clear evidence of some sort of rudimentary understanding in wound healing. So if you look at these skulls that we've got here, these are um, very old and they've got some holes drilled in them. We don't know why they were drilling holes in them, but we do know that because of the round edges of the bone um, where the, the wounds were created, that these people lived for a considerable period of time after the wounds had been created. And so obviously early humans had a little bit of experience in how wounds heal. And um, there's some very recent uh, work being done in, uh, in some primates and particularly in chimpanzees, which suggests that there are, there's a genetic tendency to be interested in wound healing. So there are some chimps who choose to be very focused on wounds and they clean wounds and they lick wounds of their colleagues. Uh, and there are other uh, chimps who are very much repulsed by wounds. And so we know that that's probably the case in humans as well. So we are all the chimps who like to poke the wounds. Um, and uh, we're going to talk to you about, about what we like to do whenever we're, we're dealing with, uh, with wounds. And um, this uh, fellow here is um, a, a sort of a mummified um, Swiss chap um, who was wandering in the Eastern Alps um, nearly 6,000 years ago. And he was shot with an arrow and he fell into a, a glacier essentially and was kind of swallowed up by the ice and perfectly preserved. And when he was um, discovered in the, um, in, the, in the 40s, he had on his wrist uh, a dressing which he had made out of this material here on the bottom left, and that's sphagnum moss. And that's a, a very early absorptive dressing. It's got lots of iodine in it, and um, so it's able to clean the wound and it's able to absorb material from the wound. So even five and a half thousand years ago, humans had a rudimentary understanding of how you might treat wounds to optimize their, their healing. And during the, second, the First World War, sorry, lots of sphagnum moss was used to pack wounds in, uh, in, in unfortunate people who were injured on the battlefield. And basically, you name it, humans have had a go uh, in terms of wound healing. So all of the things that appear on this, um, this slide have been put into wounds at some stage. And some of them, you know, maybe there is, you know, there may be some sense in, in using some of the, the things that are, that are here. So the, the pincers of ants as sort of early sutures. Yep, that makes sense. Um, tar, a bit harder to understand why that's used. Beer and wine are better drunk uh, than put in wounds, I would usually advise. Um, and powdered glass and, and uh, cinnamon, no idea at all. But basically, we've been putting things into wounds and trying to get them to heal for a long, long period of time. Something that's really important to remember is that whether you are a, a human or a hamster or a horse, your wound will heal in the same way. So all wounds go through a series of overlapping phases, and we're going to run through them very briefly in just a moment. And so that means that healing is this kind of orderly biological process that aims to restore the, the cosmetic appearance and the functionality of the tissue that's been damaged. And what you as, as horse owners want, obviously, is for that cosmetic result to be really good. And you also want that to happen in as short a time frame as is, is possible. So what we're aiming for is this functional and cosmetic result. So we don't want to be in a situation like this poor person here who's quite burned in their distal, their lower leg, and they can no longer flex and extend their knee because of the contracture which has occurred as a result of this horrible scar. So this is not a functional result. Uh, the horse down there on the bottom right hand side has got a, a fungal infection. This is a horse in the Gambia um, and this is a fungal infection called pythiosis which attacks the, the deeper layers of the skin and um, this is very very difficult to eliminate. So again it's going to really impair the functionality and as you can see not at all cosmetic. And we want, obviously, that to happen as rapidly as possible. So here is um, a horse called Cindy. She's from the island of Isla off the west coast of Scotland. And she got herself caught between the wall of her stable and the back of the, of the house. And she's got this very nasty wound. And that wound has been present there for a period of, of about three months. 
you can see it looks really pretty nasty. Uh, it's got um, it's got lots of unpleasant exudates. It's got some pus. It's got some blood. It's got some dead tissue hanging down. Um, it looks a bit like a like a pizza. There's no two ways about it. And uh, if the wound looks like a pizza then it's stuck in a phase of healing that we call the debridement phase. And all the vets have done to this horse is to clean that wound manually with, a, uh, with, the, with their hand and to use uh, cold water to remove that debris. And the, the time between the first picture in the top left-hand corner and the picture in the bottom right-hand corner is six weeks. So if you optimize the conditions for wounds to heal, they will heal uh, really, really well and really pretty quickly. And of course, we want that to happen uh, at a reasonable cost to you. Wounds are expensive. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, when we present the cases a little bit later on. Um, and these are some numbers that you should, that you should think about. So um, wounds, the cells on the surface of the wound, so what we call epithelial cells, they migrate at a set rate. And that rate is 1.2 millimeters per day. So you can look at a wound and you can calculate in optimal conditions how long it will take for that wound to close. And you can see here, this is a, a slide from a, a paper produced by our American colleagues. And this is a horse that's been given a prosthetic limb. And for me, this is a welfare cost too high for the patient. So I don't think this is appropriate uh, treatment. And, and we might think about discussing that at another time. Um, essentially, just because we can fix something doesn't necessarily mean that we, that we should fix it. So a reasonable cost to the owner or the keeper of the horse and a reasonable welfare um, cost to the patient itself. We know, and I know you all well, uh, you horse owners out there, you are attracted, I think, to bright colors. And um, you like to put things in wounds. You can't help yourself. There is not a horse that comes through the door of our clinic that you haven't put something in its wound. And some of those things are, are sensible. They make sense, but some of them are not. And no matter where I've gone in the world, people put things in wounds. You can see in the top left-hand corner, that's diesel oil, which would be a very common thing to be put in the wounds in Egypt. Um, the most unpleasant thing I've come across so far is hyena feces, which are really, really not pleasant at all and certainly not helpful for wounds. But in this country, we see things that are put into wounds as well, which are not helpful. So this is um, some stuff there that we've got for putting on the um, teats of cows once they've been milked. Um, so not appropriate for wounds. Wonder dust. I've got no idea what that is. It sounds like it should be a controlled substance of some kind. Um, and even veterinary wound powder, which sounds like it maybe has got some reliability, some sort of semblance of, of um, you know, maybe that works, but it, it's a foreign body and it's not really effective. And this one here, which I know is a favorite of many, um, blue spray, uh, it's a, designed to dry out the feet of sheep that have got foot rot. It is not designed for the wounds of horses. It contains a very small amount of antibiotic, not enough to kill any bugs. And it's an aerosol, so you're putting a foreign body into a wound. And this is a good example of a wound that's been treated inappropriately with blue spray. It's got this big bit of dead necrotic tissue in the middle of it. And now it's got a blue bit of necrotic tissue and it's no further forward in terms of its wound healing. So think a little bit about what you put into wounds. And of course, we do these things because we've all heard these wacky stories uh, about, um, you know, wounds that have been that have been healed by uh, various different uh, treatments. And, and we really want to use what we call evidence based medicine. So we want to know that there's a there's evidence behind the treatment that we are using. Why does it work? Has it worked in hundreds of horses? And if so, you know, what, what should we be using it for? And it's the complete opposite of my granny always put one tablespoon of cinnamon onto my wounds and they all miraculously healed. Uh, and of course, you know, there's no basis in that. And, and one of my uh, early um, bosses in, in veterinary practice um, about 25 years ago said to me, remember that nine out of 10 of your patients are going to get better despite you. And what that means is that most wounds are gonna heal anyway. And you just have to optimize the conditions to help them heal. So just because they heal and uh, because you did something doesn't necessarily mean that that uh, was the cause of the healing. And this is a particularly nasty picture. And I apologize for showing it to you. This is a donkey in Rabat in Morocco, um, which has had an unfortunate run in with the shaft of its cart. And as you can see, it's got this very nasty wound, which involves the, the rectum um, and in fact, the anus as well. And, and lots of necrotic and, and damaged tissue there. And all that's been done to this wound is twice daily washing with water, you know, not even saline, just cold, fresh water. And you can see um, we have got a, a functional result. We've got this, it, it's, it's restored the continuity of the tissue. It's um, 
it, it's it's the position of its anus has moved a little bit, but it's absolutely it's absolutely functional. It's absolutely effective. So all wounds in all species will heal. That's an evolutionary advantage that we've all developed, uh, and it's important that um, that we remember that whenever we're looking at wound healing. The research, and I'm not going to talk about too much research tonight at all, but the research that changed the way we vets and our medical colleagues handled wound was, was this bit of research by a, a very famous scientist called George Winter, and um, he should have won a Nobel Prize for it, in my opinion. He, he published it in the journal Nature, and what he did is he made wounds on the abdomens of pigs, and half of the, the pigs, he covered the wounds with um, basically an equivalent of KY jelly, and he put a dressing on those and half of the pigs, he left their wounds to heal themselves. So he let them scab over and uh, look to see which wounds healed faster. And what he found was that the wounds which were prevented from scabbing over, which were kept moist and covered, healed basically twice as fast as the wounds which were allowed to scab over. And, and I wish um, my mother had read that paper because then all that time that I got told off for picking the scab, um, I could have told her that actually, you know, you should pick the scab, your wounds will heal faster. Um, so that's why we vets tell you we want to keep the wound covered. We want to keep the wound moist because that is going to optimize the speed of wound healing twice as fast if covered and kept moist. So we rediscovered the, the benefits of moist wound healing. This is Ethel. Um, she lives in, um, in Glasgow. Uh, she smokes 60 a day and she probably has a wee dram of whiskey before she goes to bed at night. And all of the research on wound healing and all of the products for wound healing are designed for the wounds on Ethel's lower leg. And you can see here, she's got a horrible wound. It, there's lots of material, necrotic dead material there. It's not a nice looking wound at all. And it's about as different from the wound on a horse as you could possibly imagine. And that's a problem for us. It means that lots of the research that's being done and lots of the products that are available are designed for that wound and not necessarily the wound of a horse. So before we start, we really need to establish a few important points. There is nothing on the planet today which feeds, speeds up wound healing. So we cannot accelerate wound healing. So no matter what the Google search that you've done in the past to find a product that speeds up wound healing tells you, there is nothing that makes wounds heal faster than nature intended. We can only optimize that. We can't make it happen faster. The vast majority of the wounds that we encounter will heal, but they will heal better and faster if we optimize the conditions for healing. And you need to understand how your wounds heal in order to positively influence uh, wound healing. And just for a second, think about what you do when you cut your finger. You go straight into your kitchen, you turn on the cold tap, and you put your hand under the cold water, and you run some water to remove the debris, uh, and then you put a clean dressing on your wound. And if you think about how effectively that works for you, then that's really all you need to do with your horse. Uh, not put anything fancy in the wound, not leave it open to get the air at it, but actually to, heat, to, to treat it in the same way as you would a wound on yourself. So I'm gonna run you through briefly the, the stages of wound healing because they're important. So the first phase of wound healing is what we call the inflammatory phase. And during that first couple of days after the wound happens, the wound fills with a protein called fibrin, which comes from the blood that runs into the wound. And then we start to see some white blood cells moving into the wound to protect the wound from infection. And the, the, the white blood cells that go in first are called neutrophils. And in the horse, what we know is that there are fewer neutrophils. So that's why we start to see differences in the wound healing of horses compared to dogs or cats or humans, because there are fewer of these uh, white blood cells in the wounds of horses. And even looking at different types of horses, and I, I don't want to show you too many um, pictures uh, from under the microscope tonight, but these ones are interesting. The, the picture at the top is um, a picture stained of a, of a wound of a horse, a thoroughbred in fact. And the picture on the bottom is the wound from a native breed pony, um, a Highland pony in this case. And what you can see is the little purple or blue spots are white blood cells. They're the neutrophils. And look how many more there are in the native breed pony. And we know that our native breeds heal faster and with fewer complications because they have more white blood cells in their wounds. And we also know that those white blood cells are producing more of the important inflammatory chemicals which help wounds to heal. So that's why we know that we see more problems in the wounds of horses than we do in native breed ponies. And we also see differences in the number of these cells in different areas of the horse. So there are fewer cells available in the lower legs compared to uh, wounds on the body or the trunk or the neck of the horse. 
After the inflammatory phase, the wound gets rid of the dead stuff. So we call that the debridement phase. And at that point, that's when the pizza comes along. So this one is your classic pizza. We've got anchovies as well as cheese and tomato. And that's the wound trying to get rid of as much as it possibly can. Uh, and at this stage, we have some different cells that go in there that, that have a job of gobbling up uh, that material and getting rid of it. And this is the phase where the wound is most often presented to a vet because it's got stuck in this phase where it's full of rubbish and it can't move on to the next phase of healing. And then finally, um, or nearly finally, we have the repair phase and that's where we start to have new tissue being laid down. And in the horse, that new tissue is proud flesh, what we call granulation tissue. This is a, a wonderful scaffold of, of blood cells and blood vessels um, which start to give strength to the wound. And you can see um, they're this, um, this lovely color. Uh, and around the edge of the wound, we've got this white margin and that's the advancing edge of the new skin cells, the epithelium, which begins to go over the surface of the wound. And finally then, um, this is a, just another picture of, the, of that granulation tissue. And the final phase is the maturation phase. And that's when the new skin cells, which have come across the front of the wound, begin to get some of the other structures that we normally see in skin back. So sweat glands and, uh, and hair follicles, and we start to see return. Something that's really important, and, and, and the guys are gonna touch on this in one of the cases later on, is that it's important to note that the scar is exactly that. It's a fibrous patch. So it's never as strong or as functional as the original skin. And that's something that we really have to, to think about and be careful about whenever we're dealing with these cases. So nothing has yet been discovered that speeds up wounds and wound healing. And you must ask yourself the question, what can I do to move this wound along the various uh, stages of wound healing to move it to the next stage and to get it to heal as quickly and as cosmetically as possible? Put these 12 things now, burn them on the back of your retinas, download them into your brains. This is the most important slide I'm gonna show you. These are the recognizable factors that may inhibit wound healing. And there is no dressing or bandage or spray or drug or you know, magic that you can do, which allows you to ignore these factors. They're present in the environments of where all of our horses live. So foreign bodies and infection and movement and, and um, you know, health status of the, of the animal. If your horse has got Cushing's disease, if your horse has got equine metabolic syndrome, if, if there's other disease going on, you know, that's going to affect how wounds heal. So sometimes finding the inhibiting factor and removing that or ameliorating that is going to help you move the wound into the next stage of healing. And the first thing we do when we look at the, the horse is to just stand back and, and get an overview of what's going on. It's the most important thing I've ever been taught in veterinary medicine. And, and um, owners put pressure on vets to, to jump in and, and start doing something. But actually standing back, I one of the great things about working in a hospital is that um, I, I get to see the horse without the owner. Um, and I can put the horse into a stable and I can stand outside the stable and look in and, and see what the horse is doing. Because as soon as you touch the horse, you change its behavior, its heart rate changes, maybe its temperature even changes, its behavior changes. And so the other things that might be going on that might be more life-threatening than the wound, then they start to be difficult to see. So if the horse has, for example, got a wound over its chest, um, you don't know uh, that it's not got involvement of some of the underlying structures unless you do a full clinical examination. So sometimes you can be blinded by, by the wound because we're all excited by the wound and we can get focused in on that too soon. We need to obviously use sedation and local anesthetic techniques to help us uh, to find out what's going on. And we'll probably ask for quite a detailed history to find out a little bit about the mechanism of injury and how the horse was wounded in the first place. This is one of my favorite pictures in all of the world. Um, it's not the last unicorn in Scotland. It is, in fact, a horse that's um, wounded itself. Um, I, I got this um, picture from colleagues in, uh, in the University in Glasgow where I uh, used to work. And this horse has been uh, out hunting for a day. It's gone through a, a thicket of rhododendrons and it now has um, a rhododendron branch sticking out of its, um, its frontal sinus. Um, and it looks awful. And, and you, know, you would be understandably upset if, you had, um, if this was your horse. But you can see straight away by standing back this horse was calling to its colleague, its friends in the other boxes in the holding area where it, where it came into the clinic. It's looking around it. It's moving its ears normally. Yes, it's got some blood coming out of its nose because 
it's got a bit of stick sticking into one of its sinuses. But, you know, you can tell fairly fairly quickly that this horse's life is not in danger. Uh, we can remove this stick. We can deal with the contamination in the sinus and we're going to expect to have a good outcome in this case. So the first bit of information that I'm going to want to impart to you today is do not panic. Um, many years ago, I was asked to do surgery on a rhinoceros. I uh, went into the enclosure um, to do the surgery on the rhinoceros and they told me that they were only going to sedate it because it was very valuable and they didn't want to, um, they didn't want it to die of the anaesthetic. So I had to get in beside the rhinoceros and um, I'd read in a journal that the, the, the way that most vets are injured doing surgery in rhinoceros is when they turn around and just kind of squeeze you against the wall. And at the end of the surgery, I got out of the enclosure and uh, the owner of the zoo said to me, I can tell you've done this many times. Well, I had never done surgery on that rhinoceros and I uh, have never done surgery on a rhinoceros since, but I gave the impression that it was not the first rhinoceros that I'd seen that day. And that is what you should think about doing whenever you come across a wounded animal or a wounded horse or a horse with an injury. Put all of the emotion out of the way. Just think about the facts. What do I need to do? And don't panic. Really, really important whenever you're dealing with any of these kind of high stakes situations. Most wounds are not particularly painful. You've all had a wound um, and you've probably found that there's some pain initially, but then very quickly uh, the pain dissipates. So if the horse is not using its limb for whatever reason and it's got a wound, there's probably something else going on. So you can see in this case, we've got a wound overlying the hawk, but this horse is non-weight bearing lame. And that's because it's got a, a fracture of its lower leg, far, far more serious and, and life-threatening than the wound itself. So you might find that we're asking lots of questions when we see uh, that the wound seems to be causing a lot more pain than we expect it to be. Lots of horse owners are going to hope that we're going to close the wound, um, and very often that's not possible. Here's a wound heavily contaminated, a, a dead um, flap of tissue hanging down. There's no way that we can safely close this wound. There's no tissue left to close this wound. And so we may need to manage this wound open uh, and get it to close by contracting and by covering with these new epithelial cells. So um, that, that is often a, a frustration to owners and, and obviously not very much we can, we can do about that. But we're going to come on to some techniques such as skin grafting a little bit later on. If we can, we're, we're going to close as many wounds as we can. And we've got some really super techniques for doing that using lots of new uh, materials, staples, suture, glue. Um, and uh, these techniques can work uh, very well. Sometimes we'll delay the closure for several days because we want to remove the debris. We know that um, wounds will heal better if we get them as clean uh, as possible. So uh, in this case here, you can see this is a horse in the middle of the, the, the picture there with a wound on its mouth. And this horse had a wound going into the mouth itself. It's very contaminated with feed material. And so we managed this wound open for 48 hours, get, got it to a level where the contamination was very much reduced and then um, closed it. And, and that allowed the, us to, to get a, a nice cosmetic and functional result. But oftentimes we're going to be left with this idea of what we call second intention healing. This is nature's method of healing where the wound closes by contracting and then by being covered by, by new cells. In some cases, we're going to be very clear that we want to have very nice anatomical reconstruction. So you'll be aware that horses can only breathe through their noses. And so we want to close wounds of the nostrils very, very carefully so that we don't get a constriction of the size of the nostril and a reduction of the air going in. Um, and so that's going to be an area where we want to really do very careful reconstruction. But in other areas, careful reconstruction is not going to be possible and it's not important. We know that wounds, even a wound as large as this one on the abdomen of this horse, are going to heal um, albeit they're going to heal quite slowly. And we should assume that all wounds of horses are contaminated. Uh, and we should think about washing those wounds as soon as we possibly can. Saline is the best thing for washing wounds, but if you don't have saline, then water is a very close second. You don't want the water to be too cold, but if you only have cold water, then that'll be fine. What you don't really want to be using is any kind of antiseptics. So heavy scrub and um, pevidine iodine, which you may have in your first aid kit, all very well for cleaning a bit of skin to do surgery on, but they do kill cells if they're used above these concentrations. So in our practice, we, we don't use these at all on the wound itself. Around the wound, okay, but not on the wound. That's really, really important. And you know, all equine establishments have a hose. It's a, a veterinary cliche, but dilution is the solution to pollution. Uh, and the, the, the earlier you can do lavage, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, um, 
We have some really fantastic new techniques for cleaning wounds, and, and this is something that uh, Northumbria have invested in and, and they're using a lot, um, I believe. This is the VersaJet, which is a technique that gives us hydrosurgical lavage. So this is using a very big, very powerful vortex of water to actually clean away the surface of the wound. So it removes the, the bacteria, the dead tissue, um, all of the things which are going to inhibit healing, the, the, the contents of the wound that we call the bio burden. So basically the rubbish in the wound. And here it is being used on a, a wound that's a bit noisy. And this technique was developed um, uh, on the battlefield. So lots of very interesting wound therapies came from, from the, the various wars that are happening around the world. So battlefield medicine has given us this ability to clean a wound in a way that we couldn't have cleaned it before. So if you've got a very, very contaminated wound, a wound that's got that kind of gray sludge that you get in, in the mud in, in this country and um, that's impregnated into, into all the tissues. You can't clean that with normal lavage. You can't even surgically remove it uh, very effectively, but the VersaJet does a wonderful job of that. So this has been a huge step change in the ability to clean wounds. And here's an example of one that's been cleaned up. You can see um, this is a wound which is quite heavily contaminated. Um, when it's uh, turned around here, you'll see, uh, look at that horrible gray um, look on the inside of that wound, not very nice at all. Um, and uh, after the wound has been cleaned up and the, the tendon's been sutured back together, you can see it makes a beautiful job of cleaning up that wound uh, in a way that we just could never achieve uh, by using other techniques. Oops. Uh, and this uh, wound has been closed. You can see here, uh, the horse has been and placed into, into a cast um, and is moving along there um, very nicely in the, in the cast, as you can see. And here's the wound on the right-hand side uh, closed. So, um, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have closed that wound. We would have allowed it to heal by second intention. But now, because we can clean these wounds in a much more effective way, we can close them and get a, a functional and a cosmetic result much more quickly. But you don't need a, a fancy lavage machine. You can go down to the local garden center. You can buy yourself for 20 pounds um, one of these sprayers for putting weed killer on your garden. And you can use that to clean up the wound. And you can see here, um, this is just a garden sprayer being used. Um, so, um, and I'm sure your local veterinary practice will sell you a little bag of salt at just the right um, uh, weight. And you can fill that up to a, a level on your, um, on your garden sprayer and that will give you some saline that you can use to clean the wound. And you can be doing this before you even get veterinary intervention. So phone the vet, tell them you've got a wound that needs to be seen, and then you can go back and start cleaning the wound. And that's really effective. And if you look at this wonderful paper here that was performed in humans, and basically what this says is that for every hour sooner that you wash a wound, you half the risk of wound infection. So the sooner you start cleaning that wound, the better. It also stops you putting things in the wound. If you're cleaning the wound, you can't be applying some sort of unpleasant material to it. So wash the wounds, really, really important. It's the single most important thing that you can do. We're also very interested in where wounds are. So wounds that look really dramatic, like this one over the lateral, over the side of this horse's shoulder, looks really, really pretty scary. And I think if this was your horse, you'd be pretty worried. But contrast that with the wound on the, the horse on the right-hand side, you probably can hardly see where this wound is. So let me give you an arrow, a small wound over the elbow. This wound overlying a joint is much, much potential or potentially much, much more serious. And as you can see here, this is wound has been closed up, looks, looks pretty nice, nice job. Whereas this one here, we're putting some sterile fluid into the elbow joint and look here with the arrow, we're getting water coming out of the wound. So we know the joints involved and this horse is now needing to go for a, a, an operation to have that joint lavage. So you will see vets becoming much more concerned about small wounds overlying a joint or a tendon sheath and they might be uh, or, or over large wounds, sorry. Movement is the next thing we're going to be really worried about. You can see here, we've got this uh, wound here, um, which is um, on the lower leg of the horse. And uh, as we flex and extend this horse's lower leg, look at this great area of proud flesh, which is stuck onto one of the tendons and it's moving up and down through the wound. And you can imagine that the, the new skin cells, they're just never going to migrate over the surface of that wound um, because of all that movement. So we have lots of techniques which we use to, to get rid of movement. I'm going to cover these very briefly because the, the team are going to cover them in, in much more detail uh, very shortly. But here's a, a wound on the, on the heel bulb, um, which has been popped into a, into a cast. 
and um, this is the wound uh, at uh, cast removal at two weeks. So you can really get a, a fantastic result if you can reduce the, the risk of movement. Another example of that, a wound over the back of this horse's hawk. Um, this is a, a horse from the, the west coast of Scotland, a, a Reading stables horse. Um, this horse was put into a, into a cast as well. And you can see here, um, the wound had been present for um, about nine months before uh, the horse was treated um, by, by the vet team. And you can see here, with only 13 days in the cast, um, we've got a wound which is now contracted and fully granulated. So you can just see how, how sort of debilitating the movement really can, can be. And uh, this wound was also grafted and, and, uh, and, and came out with a very nice result. Uh, another wound where movement is a big issue on the front of the hawk. Um, and you can see here, we would be concerned about involvement of the hawk. And what we've done in this case is that we've got this horse into a very nice big dressing uh, and we've closed the wound. And um, sometimes we will leave dressings like this on for quite a long period of time. And owners can find that quite disconcerting that we're gonna cover the wound up for maybe even seven to 10 days. And you can see this horse doesn't like this dressing um, just coming out of the theater there, um, but they, they usually get used to them fairly quickly. And this is that wound um, at, at, uh, at the start on the left-hand side. This is it at, at the point of removal of the dressing. And you can see there that that wound has stayed together because we've been able to keep it immobilized. So immobilization, a really important step in, in treatment of these types of wounds. We're always worried about foreign bodies because they are ubiquitous in the environments of horses. You can see uh, here on the top left-hand corner, a horse that's had a wound for over a year. And this um, came to us uh, having seen a variety of different people. Um, it would get better and, and heal up whenever it was given a course of antibiotics. And then after two or three weeks, um, the uh, horse would, would have a wound again. And uh, nobody had ever taken an x-ray of it. And when we did that, you can see it's absolutely filled with these foreign bodies. And so there's always a reason why a wound won't heal. The horse can also make its own foreign body. If there's a bit of exposed bone, then that bone can die and become what's called sequestrum. And uh, that will also need to be removed. So if the wound is not healing in the way that you think it should be, you have to go back and look for an impediment to, to healing. We should never talk about wounds without talking about tetanus. Um, I, one of the horses that I did surgery on today, um, we do a routine checklist before surgery and um, this horse had not been vaccinated against tetanus and no horse should have a wound made in it or should be allowed to really be living anywhere in the UK without a, an up-to-date tetanus vaccine. This is in um, Morocco. This is a donkey with tetanus. Um, once your horse, once your equid has tetanus, it has a 50% survival rate and you can avoid all of that with um, a very simple vaccination. So really important that we check the tetanus status of the horse. And um, the, the classic signs of tetanus uh, would be um, that this kind of very saw horse stance, they call it a very stiff and stilted gait. And you can see there the third eyelid of the horse prolapsing. Um, so coming across uh, and being very slow to go back, signs of, of tetanus. So don't forget about making sure that your tetanus vaccinations are, are up to date. Last couple of things then before we go on to some cases, um, you're all aware that the horse is the king of proud flesh. Um, horse, this is a bit of proud flesh with a horse attached, um, which is what we sometimes uh, see in, in wounds that have been left for a while. So uh, the horse can develop this incredible exuberant proud flesh in excessive amounts. And of course, proud flesh is really, really important. It's, um, it's a scaffold for the new skin cells to migrate over the surface of the wound. But if it looks abnormal, if it's very enlarged or knobbly or very pale, or we've got lots of um, sort of dips and, and uh, nooks and crannies in it, like, like this one uh, over on the left-hand side, then it is abnormal and it needs to be treated. So what we're looking for is very healthy um, proud flesh or granulation tissue, and it should be salmon pink. And I, I don't mean peely wally farmed salmon, I mean, wild Alaskan salmon pink. So a beautiful um, pink color and it should have a white margin around the outside of it. That's the epithelial cells, which are waiting to migrate over the surface of the wound. So that's how the, how the proud flesh um, should look. And we should be very kind to the proud flesh because we know it's very important. So we should be supporting its development if we possibly can. Um, just to uh, make sure that you're all well and truly put off your dinner, um, I'm going to uh, finish off with um, a couple of uh, little new things which I thought might be of interest to you. And, and the first thing is a little bit of help from our friends. And in this case, it's the maggots. And um, maggots were used uh, a lot in the, in the past. 
Um, you can see here Napoleon Surgeon uh, reported during the campaign in Syria that he noticed that certain species of fly seem to be very effective in dealing with um, the wounds on, on injured soldiers. And during the American Civil War and World War I, um, there was, it was very clear that wounds would, would heal um, a, little bit, um, a little bit better if there were maggots in them because the maggots would remove the, the dead tissue. I'm not sure that smoking a cigar during surgery like this guy in the, the top right hand corner is, is advisable. Um, but anyway, I guess it was, uh, it was different times. How do maggots work then? Well, they secrete enzymes um, out of, they, they essentially uh, um, regurgitate enzymes into the wound that dissolve the protein and the dead tissue. And they only go after dead tissue. Uh, so they won't take away healthy, live, new tissue. They only take away the dead tissue. And in doing that, they also um, do directly take in then bacteria which are living in the wound and they release chemicals which are have antibiotic effects as well and they change the environment of the wound so they help to make it a bit more acidic and they make it more oxygen available in the surface of the wound and special species of maggots are used in order to to be able to um, to, to do this effectively now um, they are used in human surgery a huge amount and in human surgery the two major complaints about the use of maggots and I apologize for telling you this, are that they make a lot of noise and that they go missing. So you can imagine the situation, they're lying in a hospital bed, they come along with 50 maggots, they put them into your wound, they come back uh, the following Tuesday and they can only find 37. And uh, you know, that's you know, pretty alarming if you're a human, where have those other maggots gone? Well, actually where they've usually gone is that they've usually been eaten by their colleagues. Um, but you know, that doesn't stop Mrs. McDonald worrying about whether there's a maggot somewhere loose in her bed. So the way around that was to put maggots into a tea bag essentially. And I apologize for or the, the next picture, it's quite unpleasant. Um, but basically the maggots are able to um, excrete their enzymes and absorb the, the products through the, the, the holes in the tea bag. And after several days, this is how the tea bag looks. Um, and you can see what's happened here is the maggots have beautifully cleaned this wound to allow the surgeon then to come back and only remove the tissue that needs to be removed. So that's the advantage. The maggots know, know what's dead and they know what's alive. Now, in veterinary medicine, of course, we're less worried about using maggots in a tea bag. They're much more expensive in a tea bag. So we tend to get them free range. They come from a company in Wales um, and you can get them guaranteed next day delivery uh, on prescription. So you phone up and you, you order them by the hundred. They come in a little jar and then um, you put them into the wound and they just do a remarkable job. Of, of cleaning things up. And, and here's, um, this, is, this is how they look close up with these sort of horrible mouth parts that they've got, but they're wonderful for a sluffy wound, uh, wounds on the foot, uh, they work really, really well. Infections that are resistant to antibiotics and in areas where there's, you know, just a wound that's been, been present for a long time, producing a lot of dead, a lot of dead tissue. Here's a great example of one you can see here uh, where maggots were used. And this is a, a poor horse which um, had a chronic uh, penetration of its sole. You can see that's me putting fluid into the coffin joint. And when we put the fluid into the coffin joint, it sprays out of the sole of the horse. And, and that's a, obviously a huge problem. And my worry here was that I, I knew there was lots of dead tissue in there, but I was worried about going up with my instrument and damaging the coffin joint. And if you, if you look at this x-ray here, uh, you can see that there's a huge area of bone missing um, here because that's been sort of damaged by the infectious, um, the infectious process. So what we did in this case is we put some maggots uh, onto the sole and you can see them here. Um, and there they are all just writhing about, having a wonderful time. Um, and they're removing all of that necrotic uh, tissue and uh, allowing you to be much more, you know, they're much more discerning about what's dead and what's alive. Uh, and um, this horse um, made a, an absolutely fantastic recovery, as you can see. So I'm very grateful to the Markhams for letting me use this um, use this this picture. So the foot of the horse ideally suited to um, to to maggot therapy. And and maggots are actually this is a a, a case from Alnathumbria uh, where maggots were used, and and uh, in one of them Ed's cases, and and you can see them there in this very big defect. And um, you know, they're, and look at the tissue underneath; it's beautifully healthy and pink. Uh, and the maggots will do that really fantastically, fantastically well. And maggots are, are better than, than vet students for, for three main reasons. They work day and night and you don't have to feed them. And when you're finished with them, you can kill them. Um, so they're just a, a, remarkable, a remarkable thing to use. So we do use them lots. And, and uh, even if they, they seem a bit nasty, um, then they may be used in, in the wounds of your horse. 
The final thing that's new, which I think is really exciting, is uh, something else from the battlefield, and that's negative pressure. So that's where we apply a constant vacuum to the wound. And this was actually discovered by the Greeks and the Romans. They, they did it with a special thing called a sucking jar, where they put a, a glass jar over the wound and heated the, the glass jar, and that created a vacuum within the jar, and it removed um, the, the, the debris from the wound. And we know that when we put a continuous vacuum onto a wound, it um, roughly um, it increases the, the rate that the wound contracts and also the rate that new blood vessels are formed in the wound. And, and this is a, a wound that you can see that we've recently used uh, a system which has just become available. So you can see again, lots of unpleasant exudate and, and dead tissue in this wound. Um, we use this special um, bit of foam dressing that goes into the wound and then we actually uh, use a, a hair dryer, sorry for the noise, um, to stick the dressing uh, to the horse's wound. So that's stuck over the, the top of the wound like this. And then what we do is we turn on the, the vacuum. So I'll just show you this vacuum being turned on. So the vacuum goes on and you can see it's sucking down uh, over the, the wound and really pulling itself right down into the wound. And this is a, a negative pressure of, of 250 millimeters of mercury. So quite a high pressure. And you can see the little, little kit and the horse wears it um, on a little surcingle uh, around its uh, abdomen. And we leave this in place for about 72 hours. And you can see the effect it has on the wound. And um, that's the material that's been sucked out of the wound in a 24 hour period. And look how wonderfully healthy that tissue is. So what I'm really getting at is there are some wonderful new innovations um, that are available now. Maggots, the VersaJet, hydrosurgical lavage, and now vacuum therapy, which are all helping us to create wounds which are, are healthier and heal faster and with less complication. So in summary, questions to ask when you're faced with a wound in front of you. What stage of wound healing it is and, and what steps are needed to move the wound into the next stage? Are any of the impediments to healing present? So is there lots of movement? Is it a wound over a joint? Is the wound near a structure which needs extra help, like a joint or a tendon sheet? Is it contaminated? Well, almost certainly if it's a horse. How old is the wound? Has it been there for a while or, or is it a very acute wound? And is there anything else wrong with the horse? So is there damage to an important structure like the, the chest or the abdomen underneath? And really getting the horse sedated, washing the wound with clean water and applying a bandage is all the first aid that you need to do until the veterinary surgeon uh, arrives. And so um, that's, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and we can um, move on to some, some really interesting cases. Thank you, Pat. Um, we're moving straight on to our first um, case reports, but thank you for that. And we'll take some questions later from the, um, the, the horse owners watching. Okie dokie. Hi, I'm Alice. Um, and I'm going to talk about our first case tonight, Doc. Um, Doc came in from the paddock with a, with a wound on his sort of heel bulb slash passant area. Um, it's very sort of classic area really for the wounds to get from overreaching um, or getting the hooves caught in the wire fencing. Um, but luckily the, the owners are really good, made a decision to bring him in and um, it meant that he was going to get looked at in a really clean um, facility with lots of, you know, good people to help um, and we've got all our, um, all our equipment to hand. Um, initially, we lavage the wound, um, give it a really, really good clean, um, and try to try to close it um, primarily with um, tension relieving sutures. We encountered a few problems because of where the wound was. Obviously, it's a really high motion area with that joint there, and every time he takes a step, that wound is gonna is gonna move. So, with Patrick talking about immobility being one of the key factors for wound healing this was not going to be a really easy one to, to get going. The other thing was that um, as we sutured across the flap there, um, we couldn't suture the bottom of the flap because it was just bordered onto the coronary band. And also the um, outside of the flap didn't meet across, fully across the wound bed. So we're also going to have an issue with the flap moving across the bottom of the wound bed as well. Um, so there's a few issues with it, but we sent him home um, that night, um, but we knew that Doc was going to come in for an elective surgery the week after, um, and we discussed 
putting a cast on his foot when he came in that next time. Um, so in the meantime, we did change his bandage um, in the week between when we initially saw him and the surgery. Um, and as you can see, some of the sutures have broken down due to the movement that skin flap was not um, sticking down onto the wound bed at all um, and just wasn't granulating down properly. Um, and so despite, you know, a really clean wound and it was brought straight in, just, just wasn't doing that well because of all those inhibiting healing factors that we mentioned before. So Doc came back in and um, when he was in the clinic, we put a cast on his foot and it went around the whole foot up to the mid paston. This was um, done here. Um, it's a really quick and easy thing to do and we can do it. He was under GA, so we did it under GA, but it can also be done standing under sedation too. Um, and he was sent home due to have it removed in two weeks time. The benefits of casting, as I was saying before, is immobility. Um, it means that that joint isn't going to be moving anywhere near as much. Um, and it's really comfy for him to walk around in and it just keeps that wound super immobile. Um, the other thing is that the owner doesn't have to do really frequent banners changes um, and it can keep a lot of costs down um, associated with that. So I think, I mean, in the two week period where he would be normally having banners changes every three to four days, um, with each bandage costing approximately sort of 70 pounds in bandage material, that's over sort of 200, 250 pounds um, saved where you don't have to sort of spend any of that money in bandage material and you just have a cast on the whole time. Um, and he's really comfortable walking around the stable um, at home with that cast on. The owner was given really strict you know, instructions for monitoring that cast. Um, Often, if there's a cast that's really sort of difficult to manage, we'll keep it in the clinic. But because the owner was really competent with and happy with the instructions for looking after it at home, we did send him home. And here he is in the trailer, um, off to go back home. Um, and assessing the assessing the cast is really important. You do it twice daily. Um, you're really checking for sores underneath the cast due to rubbing. Um, and so, as he moves in, it obviously it's a fixed um, it's a fixed cast. He will incur a, a marginal about a rub, rub, about an amount of rubbing but we try and feel for heat on the outside of the cast you remove the elastoplast on the top and just check that there's no sores at the top and there's no discharge um, and if there's any sudden change in in, um, in soundness and he suddenly goes lame then we really need to get that cast off and have a look at it and, and that's when we'd be worried but otherwise um, as long as those things are checked and they're completely normal and um, he was happily at home two weeks later he got brought back in for the cast to be removed. And as you can see here, the, the flap had completely granulated down and there was a small healthy granulation bed um, left there of the wound. And as you saw from, from Patrick earlier, it's got that nice pink, pink color where the tissue is, the granulation tissue. So we know it's healing really well. It's stuck down completely. Um, and he was sent home and addressing for the, back, for the owner to change um, for that to finish off healing at home. And Finally, this is the result after a few months time. So obviously it's healed nicely over. He's been sound the whole time um, and he's back to back to full work. So he's a happy horse and um, yeah, went really well. That's, um, that's the end of mine. I don't know if I wanna go on to Nerea who's um, doing the next case. So just uh, well, Nerea's just uh, getting her case uh, shared. Just a, a wee reminder: if you if you've got questions, uh, do use the question function, um, which is on, on your dashboard at the bottom. You'll see their Q and A, and you can type your question in, uh, and we'll we'll either answer as we go along or answer at the end. So don't be shy. Uh, lots of good cases here to ask about. Uh, Alice, I need you to stop sharing your screen. That's it. Okay, so we have the second case. Uh, this handsome chap was called Chester. Um, it was the initial presentation. Ooh. Um, the fresh wound, the owner found it straight away after it happened. He had a bit of confrontation with a gate. Um, and he obviously didn't win. Um, they rushed into the clinic. 
some problems that we had with these wounds or some concerns like a really high motion area and the stifle, we have some bone exposure, massive dead space, which means that it's a massive gap between the edges. And then because the place it was, we had some concerns about possible joint involvement, possible fracture because he was quite sore due to the trauma. We didn't know the amount of tissue damage that we could have potentially. And we didn't even know if he was going to, uh, we we're going to manage to stitch it up due to the big space that we had. Um, initially, the investigation was focused in knowing if there was any joint involvement. Surprisingly, uh, another vet managed to tap the joints. There was no joint involvement, no fracture seen on the x-rays. And we managed to bring the edges nicely together. But um, a few days later, as we see, uh, the stitches broke down. Uh, concerns with this wound or things to keep on top were the high amount of discharge that we had that is usually related to the amount of dead space that we had. And because in this case, there was quite a big space. We had just discharge draining and draining. So it's quite important to protect the healthy skin uh, underneath these wounds. And we just can do it with simply applying some a thin layer of Vaseline to protect the skin from burning. Um, and also we had a big amount of movement uh, because just in the cycle we couldn't bandage or we couldn't put a cast to try to mobilize it. So everything lead to suture breakdown, uh, as we can see in this last picture, after a week of putting the stitches on, um, the wound just had to be left to heal by second intention, as Patrick has mentioned before. Um, also, as Patrick has mentioned before, we have some inhibiting healing factors that we have to keep in mind every time we deal with a wound. And in this case, would be the dead space, massive gap uh, that we had, all the movement and the necrotic tissue and contamination that we had in this wound because it was just left open. Uh, and he, Patrick said we had the pizza in this granulation tissue, so we need to do something about it. Because we want to promote healthy granulation tissue, uh, what we did was manage pretty much the in inhibiting healing factors. So one of them was the movement, which we tried to reduce as much as possible, keeping the horse and box rest. The contamination, as we can see in this first picture before the brightment, we had that pizza with tomato and cheese. Uh, and then after the bridesmaid and making clean, we have a really nice, healthy granulation tissue. We can see that it has some clefts and it's not as flat as we would like to be, but this is just because all the movement that we had and keeping the wound clean is pretty much owners and vets work. The owner was co-hosting this wound to one twice a daily just trying to keep on top of all the contamination. And then we were just sending pictures, checking when it needed to be aggressively debrided just to keep on top of it. This wound was done in summertime, so flies were quite a big of problem, but we kind of managed to get them under control with summer fly cream. And again, we needed to promote, to protect the healthy skin around it just with some Vaseline. And also these wounds, these big wounds left to heal by second intention, they need loads of patience because it's gonna take take a bit of time. And what we need to expect when we have a big wound that is just left to heal by second intention, the main thing is just gonna take time. Uh, we need to be patient. They can be quite frustrated because like in this case, we were so happy with Chester's progression and 12 weeks. Um, we had a really nice relation tissue um, epithelium was starting to contract and he was just starting to go out for a bit of hand grazing and five minutes or not in a really small paddock like stable size and the owners two weeks after turned around for a second came back and he broke down the wound again and we have a freshly new wound that we tried to stitch up together but just decided that he had enough the first day and we didn't manage to go near with a needle again into that leg. Also, these wounds can be really stressing because we don't know if our horse is going to be sound after all this time. 
Uh, we don't know what's the damage into the structures. Uh, we don't know how the scar tissue is gonna affect those structures. So it's a bit of walking into the known after months and months of box rest. Um, I said, we'll have to, most of the cases to promote wound healing, we'll have to release movement, which means that our horse will have to be on box rest. And also once the horse is back to work or even during uh, recovery, we'll need to do loads of rehab because the horse has just been sitting in the box for months or weeks. And we don't know also what kind of damage we have in underlying structures. So it might need a bit of help as well. Also, we need to remember that vets and owners, we have to work as a team, uh, which is here to help you. Uh, if you have any concerns about the wound, we're always on the phone or pretty much when we're working, sometimes we're off as well. Um, but if we don't answer one day, we'll just check our phone the following day and we'll just have a look and decide if that wound needs further attention or we can be a bit of support as well. If you look at these wounds every day, you might not see a difference and then therefore you can get a bit frustrated. So taking pictures once a week or a couple of times a week. And then when you're getting like, oh, we're not going anywhere or we're not changing at all. Go back to the picture you took a week ago and you'll probably notice that actually that wound is getting smaller and we're getting somewhere slowly, but it's changing. Um, lots of people's concerns is that the horse can't box rest. Uh, what can I do? Uh, as Patrick told me more than once, all horses can box rest. Uh, we just need to put the effort on it. We just need to be patient and stay strong because putting a horse on box rest at the initial stages can mean that that healing process is much is going to be much shorter. And if we get bored and we just chuck the horse out, expecting it to be well behaved. It might not be, and we kind of have a catastrophic breakdown, or it can be really hard to get. We'll go back to square one after all the effort. To help our horse to be on box rest, we can just keep try to keep them busy, give them licks, swingers, treat balls, just keep them entertained. We'll just have to be careful with the sugar on these treats. Probably local would be better. Uh, Feed them frequently with a small hay net so they can, they have to put a bit of effort in eating and it'll keep them busy for longer. Just groom them, go and visit a few times a day, do some stretches just to keep them busy and keep in mind away that they're not out. Um, also with horse and box rest, uh, we have to be very careful with diet because obviously the horse is not going to be moving around so it's not going to be using as many calories as he would do on full work. So we'll have to be careful with giving calories that they don't need and the energy that they don't need. And also horse and box rest are much more prone to impaction colic when you probably all know. So we just need to make sure that they get enough water and fiber. So it's lopy feeds that usually make the trick because the horse is gonna be sitting in the stable. So muscle loss is expected. So we'll have to be careful when the horse is coming back to work, make sure that the saddle is still fitting and all these sorts of things. Also, to start when we start box rest, if the horse is really stressed and not coping well, there's some drugs that we can use, um, like the famous ACP, that is or Relaquin or Sedaline that can be used just to take the edge off the first days. And then usually the horse, the horses get used to being in the box and they just cope with it. We have this wound almost six months after injury. Um, uh, we have a healthy granulation tissue, a really nice um, pink edges that is contracting. And at this point, we have the wound almost healed. So we kind of start hand grazing our horses. Just be careful that we make it in a safe way because obviously the horse has been stuck in the box for a while so they'll be rushing to go out uh, we kind of started turning him out turning them out into small paddock initially probably box size and just increase the time and the space is lowly uh, so they don't go ballistic and running around the field and breaking down the wound that we've been working for months 
for these initial turnouts, we can use ACP as well. So the horse is not as excited of, about going out. Rehab is very important at this point because the horse has been in the box without using any muscles or pretty much any of the muscles. So physiotherapy, stretches, do loads of groundwork because we before we jump into doing read and exercise, just trying to build up all that muscle that was lost again. Uh, and then once we start riding, we'll probably just walk us up to start with and then just build them up really slowly to monitor that the horse is sound. Because as I said before, we don't know we don't know if the horse damaged any important structure or any important soft tissue structure. So we'll just have to be careful and keep an eye that the horse is not getting lame. We can think about putting any diet supplements just to help with the with muscle or fitness and then just keep communicating with the vet in case there's further integration that is needed and then a few couple of weeks after the picture that we've seen before we have this wound pretty much healed but we we'll have to remember as we've said before that the scar tissue is just going to be much weaker than normal skin so if this horse by any chance gets again into trouble or gets a trauma in that leg it's quite likely that the place that it's going to break down or get injured, it's going to be that as well again, just purely because the skin is not as elastic or strong as the rest of the healthy skin. We can be really tempted to just crack on and doing things when the wound is healed, but at this point we should not be rushing things uh, because I say the horse is not fit. We don't know what type of damage he did at the initial accident. And he's, he's probably really unfit and we just have to take time, build all the muscle again and just gradually come back to work. And all the changes in management need to be really gradual just to avoid further complications like colic. Uh, if we just chalk them out in long grass after being months uh, in this table, uh, just hammer them with exercise is probably going to tie up or get any injury again so we just have to build up fitness really slowly and this one has a really happy ending and um, this Chester looking really good and back back into jumping and winning shows um so yeah just be wounds just pretty much patient uh what we need to do with deal with them so I'll just pass the the screen to Amy, who's next. Can I can I just ask, Ray? We had a question. Uh, one of the um, people in the audience were asking how you'd achieve the debridement. Um, I'll just go back to that slide. Uh, in this case, we were just pretty much the orders was doing with the call hosting, and then when I was going out or any of the other vets. I think you and helping as well. It was just pretty much sedating him and with dry swaps, just gently rubbing and with saline. We would flash with saline, make everything a bit soft, and then with swaps, just gently clean all the all the contamination and all the debris. So it's nothing really fancy. Um at this point we didn't have the versa yet. So it was it was kept quite simple. Uh and it was done in the yard pretty much all the times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I hope that, that answers the question. Um, cool. I'll pass it to Amy. Thank you. Um, let me just. There we go. Hopefully, you can see my screen now. Um, so my presentation is um, about Clancy, who is a 17-year-old ex-race horse um, who had an unfortunate incident with this part of a brick wall um, when coming in from the field. He, this is the wound that he managed to achieve. Um, so you can see that there's two significant wounds here. Um, this upper wound, you can see there's a small amount of bone exposed there, um, and it also ruptured the extensor tendon. So this is one half of the extensor tendon, and this is the other. 
um, he also had this big wound on the fetlock joint, which was um, very close to the fetlock joint itself, and the tendon sheath is just here, so we were quite worried about that wound. Um, so there was a lot going on when he first presented to the clinic. Um, so initially, we first, like Patrick says, we um, made sure that there was nothing more serious going on underneath. So we checked the fetlock joint. Um, and luckily, there was no communication with the fetlock joint, so that was OK. Um, we then sutured the extensor tendon back together underneath this wound. And then we sutured the skin together. Before we did this, we also cleaned the whole thing with the VersaJet um, to make sure it was as clean as possible before we started. Um, and Ed helped me with that. He's modelling here. So then we, as Patrick said, did some immobilisation. We put a large um, three layer over the hock bandage with a gutter splint onto Clancy's leg. Um, he stayed in hospital on box rest for 10 days to try and keep him as immobile as possible. And um, yeah, he didn't come out of the stable at all. Um, so this is the wound 10 days later. Um, so you can see the stitches are still in place, but they are starting to break down at the top and slightly at the bottom as well, which is unfortunate. Then when Clancy went home, unfortunately the wound broke down further um, and we were left with these two wounds to heal by second intention. Um, we assume that they broke down just because of the movement of the extensor tendon underneath the wound. Um, and the fact that Clancy struggled to keep the um, the large bandage on because he did get a bandage rub over his hock, um, and he really he was really unhappy with the big bandage, so he did struggle a bit with that. Um, he also had um, oh no, we're coming on to that in a minute. So then he had a couple of complications. Um, when he was at home. So part of the exposed bone that I showed you at the beginning um, lost its blood supply and died off. So we had to remove that a couple of weeks after he went home. And then the wound became infected. So you can see here, this wound is um, really exuberant and really dirty. Um, and yeah, another classic um, pizza. So we debrided this wound um, with dry swabs and we put some antibiotics um, into some hydrogel and put it straight onto the wound under the bandage to try and reduce that infection. So we changed the wound every four to five days and the wound started to shrink down. You can see here and here that there is some change there. Um, the main complication at this stage with Clancy was his um, bandage rub. So because this wound is on his distal limb, um, the bandage rubs are across the back of the of the tendons there um, and around the fetlock as well were quite difficult to manage. So we had to do um, some modification on the bandage to manage these. Um, and then as soon as this, the wound started to look a bit healthier, we discussed skin grafting. So what we did was we took um, little bits of skin from his neck here. Um, we took small punch biopsies and then we made some little holes in the wound and we implanted them into the wound. Um, so Clancy was sedated for this procedure. It took about an hour um, and he was very good. The neck wounds healed very quickly within about two weeks and not all of the grafts took in his leg, but about five of them took. Um, so this picture is two weeks after grafting and you can just about see these little grafts starting to take and you can see that the wound is healing. Unfortunately, there's only happened, we only grafted it three weeks ago, so we don't have a picture of the wound fully healed, um, but it's certainly looking a lot better than it was. Um, so that was mine, so it was a little bit quick. Um, but yeah, now I think we're ready for questions. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen. And then, Leslie, do you want to take over for questions? Yeah, I have a question here that um, perhaps Patrick would um, answer for a Jan Grant. She had a Highland Stallion who's now aged five as a weanling, had a huge cut to the front of the hock, fist-sized hole. The wound eventually healed, but now has a horny growth like a hoof 
protruding from the front of the hock, which grows larger every time the coat changes. It's been surgically removed once, but grew back following the following spring. Any suggestions as to how they can solve this problem, Patrick? Oh, okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. Um, I guess it would be very interesting to know if when it was surgically removed, whether any of it was submitted to a lab to see what it was. Um, there are obviously lots of things in humans, particularly where you get kind of um, what you've maybe heard of as keloid, so a, an abnormal scar. So you get essentially scar, which is hyperplastic, so it grows more than it should. It doesn't know when to stop growing. In, in horses, we also see... Um, I guess a variety of types of sarcoid, um, which can look, which can be firm and, and horny looking at times as well. So I, I would certainly want to get a sample of that tissue sent away, and um, I suspect you would you would then get an answer as to what you were dealing with, and then you would know a little bit better as to how to deal with it if you were removing it, um, and it turns out to be some sort of an abnormal growth. So I. I I hesitate to use the word cancerous growth, but certainly a neoplasm, so abnormal tissue growing out of control, um, then you might be looking at, at skin grafting whenever you, you take it away because you want to get to make a big margin so that you um, are, you know, to stop, stop, stop from coming back again. It would be very interesting to see a picture of it. That would be able to tell you a bit more about it. And, um, you know, certainly feel free to, to submit that and we could have a look at it and, and maybe give you some advice. Hopefully that helps. Um, and Lou Purvis has a question. If I can just find that. Um, how long do you need to leave the maggots in a wound to do their job? Yeah, not very long. So um, generally speaking, they, they feed for about 72 hours maximum. Um, and then they're sort of big and fat and they don't do any more after that. So usually if you think you need maggots for longer than that, then you would go back and, and get a few more maggots um, from the from the company Biome One, they're called. Um, and uh, they, they would they would send send a few more to you. Uh, one of the things about maggots is that you've got you've got to really look after them. You know, they, they, you can't just sort of throw them in and, and ignore them. Um, you've got to bandage the wound very carefully because you can asphyxiate them um, and they're expensive. They're about a pound a maggot. So it's going to be um, essentially about a about hundred pounds to to treat the maggots, you know, just with the maggots alone and then dressings and things you need over the top. And the other thing is they hate to be exposed. So when you're checking the wound, you just have a quick peek and they all sort of shoot off um, and so you don't want them to sort of leave the wound. So you just look very quickly and then get your dressing um, back down again. Actually, I recently read this amazing paper about maggot therapy, um, which suggested that the maggots are actually communicating with each other in the wound um, through sort of um, sort of high pitched noises, which is fantastic because they're, they come from whales. So basically the maggots are singing to each other in the wound. Isn't that fab? Anyway, there you go. Just an aside. And, and um, there's also leech therapy, isn't there, Patrick? Use of leeches? Uh, yeah, herodotherapy. Um, so all sorts of little um, creatures that we use in wounds. So leeches are, are particularly good for wounds where there's been some sort of a, a constriction to the blood flow. And that might be because there's been an encircling injury. So something like a you know fencing wire that gets caught around a leg and you get that, you know, the, you know, the tissue goes a kind of a horrible purple color and it's cold. Or if you've got a flap of tissue, um, so if you if you come from the west of Scotland, uh, like me, um, then it, uh, leeches get used lots when people have bits of their anatomy bitten off. So mainly that's ears. So um, ear gets sutured back on again, and they put a couple of leeches on your ear. And what that what these um, creatures do is that they they actually secrete an, an anticoagulant. Um, which gets the blood flowing again. So we, we do use them on flaps and things. And in obviously in humans, they're, they're single use, but in veterinary species, you can use them again and again. And essentially they'll, they'll feed uh, for about half an hour, an hour, and then you take them off and the wound bleeds after that. And then you put your leech um, in the fridge uh, in this special solution and, and you, can, you can keep him or her, they're actually they're, they're him and her, they're hermaphrodites. So um, they, um, they, they just live in the fridge for, for about... 12 to 14 weeks and then they're thin again and then you can pop them back onto the next the next wound so um and they they also can be got by next day, next day delivery so we've got all these uh, fabulous um you know old treatments sure you different yeah. 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 so make sure your sandwiches are in a different part of the fridge um there was another question which i think you answered patrick to do with maggots but go back to maggots do you want to kind of um repeat that question 
might be yeah, interesting. So, so that was a really interesting question. That was that obviously some people will see um, maggots in, in the wounds or, or particularly the question was about in the clefts of feet uh, that have got thrush. Right. Um, so, and you obviously see that during the summer. And the question was, you know, should they be removed? And, and, the, and the, the questioner was, was removing them with, with uh, dilute hydrogen peroxide um, and should the maggots just be left alone? And, and the answer is not really. It um, would be much better to, to sort of avoid the thrush if you can and, and treat it sort of by, by traditional methods because the maggots that are used medically are a, a particular species. They're sterile um, and they only, eat, um, they only eat dead tissue. So they're actually green bottles uh, so they're a particular species of green bottle and uh, other maggots, as you, anybody who has ever kept a, a, a sheep will know that they can actually remove normal tissue as well. The one species that you must never use maggots in, here's a bit of pub quiz trivia for you, is the rabbit um, because maggots do not stop. So basically, you know, come back the next day and you've just got a rabbit skeleton. <laughs> so, you know, you know, it's not quite as bad as that, but you certainly can't use them in rabbits. So you should only use medical grade maggots mm -hmm. and and definitely try and try and avoid any that are out in the in the wild, essentially. So, um, so there's an, another um, question from Fiona McMeekin saying, um, "Why does cellulitis sometimes develop in the wound site?" Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose the answer is it's related to the sort of associated damage that can you catch happens. Up, Patrick? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? wondering. I'm not sure. Yep. Yeah. So it's a good question. Um, essentially, it's related to the associated damage that's done to the area where the wound is. So a surgical wound, for example, um, you know, we have damaged the tissue. We close the wound. We don't need to use antibiotics because the, the area is clean and we haven't done any damage to the surrounding tissue. Whereas a wound sustained in a, you know, a blunt trauma to a horse, so a leg caught in a, in a fence or a leg that's gone down, a, down a, a hole, for example, you've got a wound, you've got lots of contusion and bruising and damage to the surrounding tissue. And that damages the tissue's ability to, to respond to the, uh, the, the bugs, essentially the bacteria that get in. And so you get the development of, of um, cellulitis. Now, one of the things that we vets have been very, very bad at is the treatment of wounds using antibiotics. So it, it is true to say that the vast, vast, vast majority of wounds do not require treatment with antibiotics. And actually treating horses with antibiotics given into a vein actually rarely get concentrations that are appropriate of antibiotic at the wound. So it's much better to use a different delivery technique for these horses that have got cellulitis. And that might be using something called regional perfusion, where we put on a, a tourniquet around the, the limb and we put the antibiotics directly into the area where the wound is, or we use some kind of a dressing which gives us antimicrobial effects. So we might use something like honey, or we might use a, a silver dressing, or we might put antimicrobials directly into a joint or a tendon sheath. Um, so targeted antibiotics is going to be much more effective for these types of, of, of wounds. But, you know, just to come back again to, you know, the one thing that you can do when you have that wound on the first day, you know, the first thing you do is go for your hose and remove that bio burden, all the, the rubbish that's in the wound. And that's going to reduce your chances of, of getting things like, uh, like cellulitis. And I suppose occasionally, you know, it's also going to be affected by, by the bacteria that get in in the first place. A really good question. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I don't see any more questions coming up except saying, oh, Jan Grant, Jan Grant saying, um, not taking enough to send a photograph. I'm sure I can encourage her, is the answer. Great. I look forward to that. That sounds really interesting. I'm, I'm going to chase that one up. <laughs> but here, one, there's something else coming up. Um, you just mentioned silver dressings. There are so many different products claiming they have silver. Is there a ratio of silver that's required? Now, that's a very good answer, I think, a question. Yeah, that is a really interesting question. Um, so the answer is that you should definitely only be using um, 
uh, an approved silver dressing. So not a silver spray or any kind of a cream that claims mm. to have silver in it. What you want is, is um, non-colloidal silver. So it's, it's just to do with how the silver is, is present in the surface of the dressing. Um, in humans, um, anybody who's, a, who's a, 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 a healthcare worker will be aware that dressings are actually medical products. So they are subject to the same sort of licensing as a, as a pharmaceutical, as a drug. That's not the case in veterinary medicine. You can technically apply anything to the wound of an animal um, if you're not a veterinary surgeon. So an owner can put anything they like in a wound. And that's why so many things are sold, which in fact have absolutely no, um, you know, uh, no efficacy at all. And in fact, the manufacturers, if they say something along the lines of contains up to 1% silver, and that doesn't mean it actually has to contain 1% silver. It could contain 0.5% or 0.1%. So I would very much advise that if you're thinking about using these kind of things, it's very much done under veterinary guidance. Um, you know, there's a, there's a right time to use these various products and there's a time when they're detrimental. The best example of that is honey, which is an absolutely wonderful treatment for wounds. But if you use it on wounds with healthy, proud flesh, then actually it, it, it slows down the rate of healing. So it's very important that you're applying these things at the, at the right time. And you know, just because it says it's got silver in it, it doesn't mean that in fact it has it in the right uh, form or the right concentration. Okay, thank you. So I think unless we have more questions, which I don't see any just now, um, I'd like to just say a massive thank you to our speakers to Patrick um, uh, for his very clear and um, graphic presentation of some very interesting, I think, new techniques that are out there uh, for wound healing. Um, and I have to say, I'm really proud of our young vets. They did a great job. So well done, um, ladies. Uh, exactly, yeah, thumbs up. That was great. Um, thank you to CVS Lou Purvis for allowing us to hold this webinar. Um, I think it's been a, a great thing to do. Um, and thank you to Barbara Buglis out of our practice for her hard work in getting this set up um, in the first place. Um, so thanks. And thank you to you guys out there that are watching. Um, we always need our participants. Um, unfortunately, we can't kind of share a beer together after this one tonight, but I'm sure there'll come a time when we can do that again. I see one more question coming up. Ah, thank you. That's very good. So that was a thank you note. That was very good. Okay, so so just to to close the meeting with with a great thanks to all our speakers um, and all the uh, the people out there watching.